So uh, welcome as everyone's joining. Um, my name's Andre Spicer. I'm a professor of organizational behavior at the Cass Business School. Um, and uh, I've spent quite a bit of time looking at the question about the future of work and how work is going to develop. Um, and obviously the pandemic is posing a lot of questions. So we thought that for our first Food for Thought series, which is the CAS uh, series um, designed for lunchtime for the CAS community and uh, friends beyond, to address this very timely and pressing in, in issue, which is about uh, how work is going to develop in the future. We're very um, lucky to have with us Bruce Daisley, who's uh, until very recently was um, the VP at Twitter in uh, Europe, and he was the most senior person in Twitter outside of the US. Uh, he was also, is indeed, and also a, um, the author of a fantastic book called The Joy of Work. Um, I guess some of you will, you realize the kind of reference point of that, the inspiration point for that book. Um, and it's a, it's a great uh, book which looks at uh, how work is developed and how we can make it better for us. Um, the other thing which Bruce might briefly mention is he's also understand has a great mailing list which keeps people up to date every uh, week or so with, with an interesting work in the area. Now, uh, this is part of a seminar series um, which is called Food for Thought. And I'll just briefly tell you about what's coming up before, um, but before we go to Bruce. So we're going to have one next week about um, lockdown, love it or loathe it. So how do you deal with change? Then we're gonna look at business models in the digital economy and how do we deal with branding? Um, the final thing I'll say before we go, I pass it over to Bruce, is um, we're going to, he's going to talk for around about 12-ish minutes or so. Then we'll have um, some questions. Now, the best way and the only way to ask questions is use the Q&A function. So there's a little button up the top, which says, or the bottom, which says Q&A. So you can ask your questions there. And then what I'll do is to bring those questions together and pose them to Bruce. So Bruce, if I hand over to you, I'll stop sharing my screen and uh, we'll hear from you. Great, Th thank you very much and uh, really grateful for the invitation to join. I guess the, the interesting thing for me is that probably the, we're in this sort of unique situation when it comes to our transformation uh, uh, with our relationship with work. Um, and probably one of the best ways to sort of express it is the fact that across offices, across the whole country, there's probably um, desk plants that unfortunately we left abandoned thinking we were going to come back to in a couple of weeks and unfortunately have perished away in the intervening 10 weeks. And I, I think it's a reflection of the fact that a lot of us saw this as a short term thing rather than a long term thing. I've spoken to a few people over the course of the last few weeks. Firstly, I chatted to someone who works at a major media outlet and he told me a couple of weeks ago, he said that we've, we've had, always had about 1,400 people coming into this office. In the last eight weeks, we've had 30 and the product's not changed. He said, anyone who thinks that we're going to go back to the way that things were before is bananas. And I think to a large extent, we, we often can see visibly that news organizations are in financial difficulties or that certain other uh, organizations are in difficulties. But we, we sometimes neglect to take into consideration how this is going to influence their decisions. I spoke to someone who works in local government. They're already thinking of how they can move from having three offices down to two offices for their, for their local council. So I think this new reality is probably dawning on a lot of people. In the last week, I've really sort of tried to, to make efforts to chat to people in the property sector, try and understand how commercial property is seeing this. And the first thing is, the interesting thing is that commercial property is seeing that at the, at the very best, the way that commercial property is going to work in the next probably 12, 18 months is a maximum of 30% occupancy, 50% if these, these strict uh, prohibitions put in place so so we can't return to the office in any normal capacity for probably the the rest of this year for sure probably till the the summer of next year and so it forces us i think to to start having uh, go through thinking of exactly what's going to happen to work and and how can we evolve it a lot of organizations i think have really tried initially to say to themselves let's keep up with the way that things were before and see if we can just get through this by transposing meetings over to zoom calls trying to keep the same routines going and I think what they're discovering is that some of those things that might have felt tolerable, the average British person spends uh, 16 hours a week in meetings, 
what might have felt tolerable when it came to physical presence in offices feels exhausting when it comes to Zoom calls. It's sort of forcing us to, to ask the question, what can we do to create a workplace culture that feels energized and, and motivating when we're, we're effectively staring into screens all the time? Again, I chatted to the, the property people concerned and the property people give a really strong sense of people in, in sort of the stages of grief, in the stages of going through denial. Um, because the, uh, when, when you chat to the commercial property sector, they say, well, look, you know, the critical things are that we're really thinking about reconfiguration, repurposing. How can offices look different? And definitely there will be a degree of that. Probably the way that we're going to use the offices that we've got we've got will increasingly be uh, that we'll use them for one of the main functions of, of offices which is community and bringing people together and so bringing sort of th that sense of, uh, of people sort of coming together and collectively bouncing ideas off each other but I think if we're not careful we're going to lose some of the strong things that the office has contributed to in the past that maybe we didn't notice one of the best ways you can see some of that is there's some wonderful work out of MIT Massachusetts Institute of Technology a wonderful guy called Sandy Pentland who did some interesting work if you've ever watched children play a game of The Sims or you've watched sort of simulation games, it's, he did a very similar thing with offices where he tracked what went on in offices and tried to work out where the good stuff lay. And he, he used badges and tracking devices to sort of work out who was speaking to who, was the marketing team speaking to the product team, was there a gap where the sales team weren't speaking to the, the right people. And what he discovered really quickly is that while we're spending 16 hours a, meet, a week in those meetings and we're spending probably the same amount of time again doing emails. He discovered that a lot of the good stuff that lay in offices wasn't in those um, those sort of scheduled interactions, but lived in the gaps between it. There's a wonderful thing I shared on, on my newsletter last week. There's this wonderful talk that he gave where he explains that they delved a bit more into that. They, they tried to understand what was it that meant that face-to-face -face conversation was such a powerful driving dynamic force in the way that we worked, but not necessarily when it came to meetings. And what he discovered was that it was because bosses weren't in the face-to-face -face conversations really interesting because it poses a sort of fundamental question to us if the conversations where bosses are in are the ones that where we can't be candid we can't be really probably transparent with the the anxieties the concerns we've got well most of the conversations we're having right now we've got bosses and authority figures in we've sort of lost those water cooler moments we've lost the lost the the casual conversation uh, coming in and going up in the, in the lift at work. So we've lost those things. And to some extent, that's where some of the value of being in offices lay. So firstly, I think the, the, the question now becomes how quickly can we transition to a new world? Because almost uh, it's, it's almost certain that many companies are going to be thinking, can we reduce our footprint of, of office space? So the, the desk mates that you used to have before and the, the conversations that you used to have on a Monday morning almost certainly have gone for good. And the critical thing becomes then how quickly can you and your organization transition to creating something that feels different but energized in a different in a different way for, for for that i've been really inspired looking at the companies that have been remote from day one so these companies like the the organization that built wordpress a company called automatic but there's also a, a lot of other digital tools things like basecamp things like buffer have existed with firms that have been completely remote most of them actually their origin story are, are pretty similar to what we've gone through now they initially all had offices but they realized that so few people were coming into their workspace they started reducing the footprint and I think that's going to be the interesting challenge of what we evolve to now it's almost certain that some firms will say okay we're going to keep the new recruits coming into the office every day we may we may say as a status symbol it will be a, an item of status you've got a desk in town and you can come in whenever you want allocated it's got your name on it but i suspect even those firms the the firms that maybe have had prestigious locations that have had uh, w would offer people desks over time are going to be presented with the fact that they've got just vast amounts of office space that are unoccupied so maybe we'll, we'll move to a situation where you can book yourself a desk rather than have one waiting for you the, so what can we learn from the companies like Automatic? What can we, we learn from Buffer and Basecamp? Well, they often talk about going through sort of levels of remote work. 
one of the first things that uh, Automatic talk about that's fascinating, they say the typical relationship with work is that you'll spend 11 weeks at your, 11 months of the year at your desk and one month a year away from your desk. In the US, they, they often don't get five weeks holidays. Or you're battling your way up to get four. And uh, so, so you, and they say, as is an inversion of that. So they say you'll spend 11 months a year away from work and then one month a year together with your colleagues. They sort of have it as intentionally as part of the recruitment process. They say, look, you know, put your care in place for your pen, for your pets, for your children, for, for whatever responsibilities you've got, because probably one week a quarter, we're going to get you together and, and create something uh, which is sort of going to create that bond, that cohesion that we normally might have achieved day to day in the office. Really interesting thing is that probably it forces us to ask the question, can you build passionate communities online? Can you build passionate communities through your screen? Well, look, anyone who's studied the last 20 years of internet history will tell you resolutely, yes, you can, but it's different. And probably the lessons for us right now when we're thinking about work are less about how did it used to work, where you forged a, a relationship with the two or three people who sat next to you and maybe the people who were in meetings with you, but rather more, how can you build a relationship that often goes through periods of intense work and a a degree more remote isolation but then these really intense periods where you're together with colleagues trying to build something the model for me so if we're going to draw from internet experience the model for me is far closer to something like comic-con uh, than the current office comic-con why because it's a community of people who've got sort of uh, their passionate interests often sort of driven by their own uh, fascination, love of comic, science fiction, whatever element of, of, of those communities they love, but they get together once, twice, three times a year for these explosions of colour and connection. And I think that's probably a really good model for us. Us thinking about what will we do to try and make sure teams feel like they are connected when we only see each other on a, a, a less frequent basis. So look, there's, there's clearly a lot of upsides and a lot of downsides to what we've, we've seen over the last few months. I joined uh, one, one lecture with some business school people. And the, the first thing that the business school professor opened with, she said, well, look, you know, a lot of us are in a position where we've sorted our home office. And, you know, I, I, as I say, sort of in a, in a business school discussion here, I think that to a large extent, that's privilege because there's many of us who are spending our day working on our beds, many of us spending our day working from the sofa. And obviously, this is stratified in terms of the experience. It's definitely better for people at the back end of their career than the, the front end of their career. So the, the, there's definitely a degree that the benefits of this aren't being equally distributed. But I think probably we are going to move to something where, you know, to return to the discussion I had with the the property sector. The property sector talked about how um, architects and, and people who are city planners, they often use this metaphor that the city is an egg. And you know, the, the, the model that they've used is probably the most recent version of the egg was a fried egg where the, the outer white spread out is, is the suburban houses that we often worked in, but we traveled into the egg yolk every day and we're transitioning to something closer to scrambled egg where these uh, people are working from everywhere where business districts don't necessarily have the same, uh, the same impact because they're not as dominant as they once were. And we've seen uh, examples of that. Barclays chief exec said that the time of bringing 7,000 people into an office every day is a thing of the past. Morgan Stanley, CEO, said, I've done a 180 on this. We believe that we don't need a footprint at all. Really interesting, uh, the, the boss of Nielsen, the research company, said probably our model is we're going to bring teams in for team meetings, but then encourage them to work remotely. So, you know, along the way, I've, I've mentioned here, I've mentioned local councils who are debating this, newspapers, research companies. It's, it's definite that this isn't going to be a short term trend, maybe in, in trendy uh, companies, but rather something more that's going to impact a lot of us. So I think our thinking about how we build good workplace cultures probably has got to change. And my, my feeling is resolutely that we need to be more inspired by those communities of passion that existed on the on the Internet, rather than trying to stick to the models that might have, have existed before. 
the uh, I read something a Financial Times article the other day. Final thing I'll say, a Financial Times article the other day, and it said the model of the models of management that have largely existed and have existed really sort of right up until now is that the job of a manager was to be ruthless, but but uh, in a kind way. And I think that that's the, the challenge for a lot of us is that our managers and our offices have tried to drive people with a degree of uh, balancing carrot and stick. And we're definitely evolving to a space where probably the defining quality of good work is going to be uh, clearer roles and responsibilities and people who are working remotely having a lot more autonomy to get their roles done in the, the way that they see fit. Fascinating change. I don't think we'll, any of us will see anything close to this degree of, of change in our lifetimes. And probably the, the critical thing is for a lot of firms, it's the actions they take now, the, the, how intentionally they set about trying to create a new culture now that's going to have a big impact on how we shape what those organisations look like going forwards. Okay, thanks very much, Bruce. Uh, fantastic and short and very quick and intense an interesting tour of some of the issues. I've got a few questions about uh, how do you build and maintain a culture when people aren't there? So uh, the Sandy Pentland study you mentioned, you know, talked about either the water cooler or the coffee machine as the place that people communicate and build culture. Um, so I wonder what the virtual version of that is. And uh, particularly, how do you build a, a culture of um, constructive challenge was one of the other questions. Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, how do you, how you do build that culture? To, to some extent, the, what um, Sandy Pentland talks about and the, the company that actually have spun off his technology, there's a company called Humanize that have done a lot of work on it. And they say, interestingly, they, they were um, largely against remote working. And the reason why they were broadly against it is they said that when we work remotely, we interact with each other about a tenth of the amount of time that we, we interact. You know, the, the Sandy Pentland thing saw value in those conversations by the coffee machine. They saw, saw value in, in broadly a lot of um, discussions that end up being business discussion start from something else. So, so their feeling was, unless you find a way to create some of those chance encounters, those social connections, um, you often lose a bit of the, the magic of the office, a bit of the, the way that we connect to each other. It's a big challenge. I think it, going forward, us thinking about probably bigger moments and moments that feel uh, more, more connected and more significant. So it might be that your team or your company doesn't have a company meeting uh, every week, but a, a few organizations have told me that they've introduced either a Friday morning or a Friday sort of three o'clock afternoon in the afternoon meeting to try and forge a sense of connectedness and and togetherness and trying to, to sort of emphasize some of the things that maybe like the humor of, of different situations moments of uh, of celebration there really sort of trying to probably dial those up beyond what would normally feel comfortable as a, as a way to build those things i think the, the second question you uh, you you said was how, how do you create a, a sense of challenging is that right how you yeah I mean probably this is one of the uh, the big issues here broadly when we we sort of look into that idea of psychological safety broadly what you discover with that idea of challenging psychological safety feeling free to to speak candidly it generally doesn't scale so if you find yourself in an organization of you know a, a football team of five people six people people are often be very comfortable with candidly giving their opinions. Transfer it to a room of a hundred people, and they probably feel reluctant to put their hands up. And so it's why some, sometimes some of the best ways you can work in these situations is make the units of, that people are working in slightly smaller. Make people feel like they're working in a unit of people where it's clear what the collective purpose of that that unit is, what the objectives of that unit are, and there's a degree of um, of being self-contained and and those organizations seem to be more able to have that that challenging discussion that ability to sort of speak up and, and and push each other it's definitely very hard i mean we already knew the challenge of of having someone speak out in a room of 100 people but having that as getting people to speak out in a zoom call of 100 people is significantly harder so you know I think trying to work out where the, the energy really lies in different situations and being um, probably more than anything, it's about experimenting right now. So it's about trying what works and then, and if it doesn't work, 
pulling back from it if it does work uh, advancing. And I think as long as you position things like that to teams and organizations, it's, it's more easy to unpick them. Okay, so I've got uh, one, well, two, two last questions. Uh, one, there's been a few people asking about co-working spaces and what the future of these are going to be. And the second thing is what difference does it make for, for sort of bosses? And there's been one, there was one particularly interesting uh, suggestion is whether we're going to see the rise of what some people might call a kind of community manager. So whose role is just like on a virtual platform to check people are not abusing it or not, whether we're going to see these new types of uh, roles appearing. So co-working spaces and these community managers. Yeah. So, I mean, the, the challenge in the short term for co-working spaces is that they, they are going to prove very difficult, difficult with, with social distancing. The, um, you know, Everyone's watching WeWork with a, a fascination. Firstly, because WeWork is the number one tenant in Manhattan, the number one uh, tenant for commercial property in London. So, you know, if WeWork, and they're, they're already in pretty public difficulty, if WeWork go under, then already uh, one of the biggest tenants in the commercial property sector has collapsed. So, you know, it, it's, it's not impossible to imagine that the commercial property sector is going to be in a situation where they're repurposing office space into residential or they're trying to work out other other uses of it so, so that that industry is facing massive disruption for the next 12 months co-working is is just going to be a difficult thing you know a lot of people just hired hired the ability to check into we work didn't ha even have a desk space and to some extent that's um that's not necessarily going to be consistent with the 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 prohibitions on, on working around people. Longer term, uh, you know, it, it's up in up in the air. We work announced publicly at the end of uh, just a, a couple of weeks ago. They announced that they collected about eighty percent of their rent in in April, and the view was that we're, they were going to collect significantly less than that in May. So, you know, co-working to a lesser or larger extent is is in question. What a lot of people are wondering if there won't be. Um, the, this idea of a polycentric city rather than everyone going into a city centre every day, but there might be a benefit in going to somewhere, especially if you don't have a home office, where you go to work, you know, so almost like you could transition. And the polycentric city model has got people talking about maybe these local co-working spaces that you can maybe anyone who works for your firm can actually all agree we all use that co-working, sort of neighbourhood co-working spaces. So big discussion on that. I think, you know, frankly, no one really knows the answer on, on those things uh, but the you know co-working definitely in the short term is going to be difficult to do it I wouldn't I wouldn't be surprised if the long-term outlook for most company offices however is that the the company maybe has a footprint of about half the size it previously had a lot of that is taking up with meeting rooms and presentation rooms and, and sort of gathering spaces and the rest of it is sort of a co-working style uh, the open atriums where people can just go and wander and, and sit and work whenever they want Okay, so I think we'll probably have to leave it there as, as we're up against the time. So thanks very much, Bruce. This has been a fantastic short um, uh, tour with lots and lots of content. And we've even had some great metaphors like scrambled eggs and fried eggs in there. So thanks very much for your time, Bruce. And people can get in contact with you and I understand sign up for your newsletter. Yeah, I'll, I'll always take any questions on LinkedIn as well. So, you know, if, if people feel like they didn't get an answer. Okay, that's great. There's, there's many more, more questions there. So before I finish up, I'll just uh, remind you that, um, that there is uh, some upcoming seminars. So there's uh, one next week, same time, uh, which is going to be about the kind of impact on dealing with uh, change in your life. Then we're going to look at digital business models the following week. And then finally, the impact on marketing and branding. And there'll be a lot more to come uh, in, in coming weeks. So thanks very much, everyone, for joining. Thanks very much, Bruce. Uh, and I hope you all have a great and productive and interesting week. Thank you.